We'll continue this lecture video on the nervous system part one, specifically looking at the cells that make up nervous tissue. So this picture here is of a nerve cell. We call a nerve cell a neuron. A nerve and a neuron are not the same thing, so we'll talk about nerves later on when we talk about the peripheral nervous system, but for right now it's important that you understand that all nervous tissue is made up of neurons. So here is a neuron, which we call it the basic unit of structure and function in the nervous system, which means nervous tissue is made up of many of these neurons, and when we say that the nervous tissue is capable of conducting electrical impulses, we're talking about the neuron specifically as the cells that conduct those electrical impulses. So it's important to understand the anatomy of the neuron. We did, or will, talk about this in lab. So we'll just review this briefly here and assign a function to each part of the neuron. So the receiving part of the neuron are these extensions coming off of the cell body, and we call these extensions dendrites. So dendrites are kind of like the antenna on a radio or the old-fashioned televisions or on your car. It receives signals from uh, either another neuron or um, some, maybe it's modified into some sensory receptor bringing information such as light, sound, temperature, temperature, touch, etc. So these are the dendrites, the receiving part. So information is coming into this neuron from the dendrites. So it's only a one-way flow into the cell body. So this enlarged area here, the cell body, we can see there's uh, mitochondria here, there's a large nucleus, there's some rough ER around the edge here. Most of the organelles in a neuron are located within the cell body. So this is where this information coming into the dendrites, this is where it's processed and propagated, sent along to this part of the neuron that hooks up with the axon. So this little triangular portion here is called the axon hillock, and we'll talk more about its important role in nervous system function when we get to our discussion of electrical potentials. But for right now, um, just know that this whole enlarged region here is the cell body, and these extensions coming off the cell body are dendrites, with information only coming into the cell here. So you can put arrows going from the dendrites toward the cell body. Then the third major important region of a neuron is the axon. It's this long, thin structure here extending away from the cell body. It carries the electrical impulses from the cell body to the end of the neuron. So this is the highway for transportation of electrical impulses called the axon. And then at the end of the axon, the information is um, sent to the end, which we call the axon terminals. So you can kind of think of this like an airport. You have a major hallway leading to the airport where you check in, and then there's different airport terminals where the different planes are going to arrive and depart. So this is the, uh, these are the axon terminals at the end of the neuron. And there's a special coating. It's a fatty covering. It's a, a lipid substance, and it's called myelin. And we find myelin insulating the axon portion of the neuron. Notice it's only the axon that is myelinated. The cell body, the dendrites, the axon terminals are not myelinated. This fatty substance is produced by a special cell called a Schwann cell, and we'll talk about that in the next couple slides. But what's important for you to understand is that the axon carries information away from the cell body to the axon terminals. It's a one-way direction. So you can see the impulse direction here. There's an arrow going toward the axon terminals. And there's little spaces here on the axon where there is no myelin. We call those the nodes of Ranvier. And again, we'll talk about why that is, why that has those bare spots on the neuron when we get to electrical impulses. But for now, just know the basic structure of this neuron. If we look at all the neurons that make up nervous tissue, not all of them look like this neuron here. This is called a multipolar neuron. And it helps us name the neurons if we look at the cell body and we look at how many extensions are coming off that cell body. Here we can see there's many dendrites and an axon that are extending away from the cell body, so therefore this is a multipolar neuron. And this is the most common type of neuron that we see in the body. So here is a multipolar neuron. Again, we can see the cell body has many extensions coming off of it as well as an axon, so it's a multipolar. Here's another example of a multipolar neuron. Many extensions coming off of that cell body. 
This type of neuron is only found in some of our special sense organs, such as the nose for smell and eyes for light and ear for sound. We have these bipolar neurons. So if you look at the cell body, you'll see there's two poles or two extensions, one here and one here. We call this we call these bipolar neurons. So these are not um, found throughout the body, so they're just localized to these special sensory organs, the nose, the eye, and the ear. Bipolar. And then unipolar means we have only one extension coming off of that cell body. So here's the cell body. There's one extension coming down from it. And this is a unique um, neuron that is found in our nerves, bringing information into the spinal cord. So when we talked about the sensory afferent pathway, well, these are would be sensory neurons carrying information into the spinal cord or brain. So this is uh, uh, the unipolar neurons. So these are much more common than the bipolar, but again the most common is the multipolar. Other cells we see in the central nervous system, if you recall from our study of the tissues, these neurons have this um, look to them of these large star-shaped structures and then there's lots of little black or dark dots in the background. Those dark dots in the background of nervous tissue are these neuroglia. Think of these as nerve glue. Essentially, they help to support and nourish the neurons. So these, this large yellow structure in the background here is a neuron. Here we can see the dendrites coming off. Here's another neuron with dendrites. And there's these supportive cells in the nervous tissue that help to, again, protect and nourish these neurons. This cell here is called an astrocyte, and it has many extensions coming off of it that wraps around the capillaries that serve nervous tissue. So this helps protect anything that might be in the blood from leaking out and infecting the nervous tissue. Because we need our brain and spinal cord to be healthy and to conduct impulses and process information, there's a very special barrier that separates nervous tissue from the general blood supply, bloodstream. And that's accomplished with the help of these astrocytes. These are called podocytes, these specific extensions on the cell of the astrocyte <clears throat> that wrap around capillaries. So they're very protective in nature, preventing things from leaking out, like infection, for example, bacteria, viruses, um, allowing them to leak out into nervous tissue. Another cell that is important to nervous system um, protection is the are the microglial cells and these are specialized cells that act as immune system cells and they clean up debris and dead organelles they can repair neurons repair axons that may have been damaged these microglial cells are active in that in that nature so think of them as protective cells kind of a cleanup crew keeping that nervous tissue healthy and free of debris and infective material Another type of glial cell are the ependymal cells. Ependymal cells we find bordering um, the brain that forms the um, protective barrier for secreting cerebral spinal fluid. So we find these in the ventricles of the brain, which we'll talk about in lab, and they secrete this fluid called cerebral spinal fluid. So that's their job, is to produce the cerebral spinal fluid, and then it also is carried along by the many cilia we find on the ependymal cells. So it moves the cilia throughout the cavity and through the, um, with the help of the cilia. Again, pen, ependymal cells. And then oligodendrocytes are similar to um, the other myelin producing cell, which is the Schwann cell, but the oligodendrocytes add myelin to more than one axon. So these are several different neurons shown here. There's one oligodendrocyte which can myelate, myelinate by adding this fatty covering to more than one. That's where the word oligo comes from. Oligo means many or much. So we see m many axons being myelinated by this one oligodendrocyte. And then lastly, we um, the Schwann cells um, are these special cells that are found around the axion, axons of peripheral nerves. Um, so on, in the axons of those peripheral nerves we find these <coughs> Schwann cells and they only uh, myelinate a portion of, an, of a single neuron. Unlike the oligodendrocytes which can myelinate, myelinate more than one neuron in, many, uh, in the entire portion of that neuron, the axon, um, the Schwann cells only myelinate a portion or a segment of it. 
again, then there's these breaks where there's no myelin, which we call the nodes of Ranvier. So the purpose of myelin is to speed transmission and protect and insulate these axons of neurons. So anywhere we see myelinated neurons, we see fast response and um, inf transfer of information from um, outside the central nervous system to the, to the central nervous system. So myelin speeds conduction, insulates, and protects these axons, kind of like plastic does on your cords coming from your radio or your television. If you break that myelin or you remove the plastic off the cord, it's going to short circuit the, the transfer of information. So here's some examples of different parts of the neuron that we could look at and see that they are not myelinated. So this letter A is looking at the dendrites. So if we stimulate a portion of the dendrite, that stimulus slowly fizzles out to nothing. So here the stimulus is strong, but if it's unmyelinated, it fizzles out to nothing. Here we have um, a non-myelinated axon that has different voltage-gated channels along its length. So that instead of just fizzling out, that stimulus is going to continue by, by changing the ion concentration coming through these voltage-gated channels. In the myelinated axons, we see a very rapid transmission of information because instead of having, um, instead of the stimulus affecting every voltage channel along the length of the neuron, we see it jumps over the myelinated area and then we see another cluster of these voltage-gated channels. So it's essentially like if you were running up the stairs and you needed to be somewhere in a hurry, you might skip a couple steps to help you go faster versus go taking every step up the stairs. So if an axon is myelinated, the impulse can jump over the myelinated area to the next area where there might be voltage-gated channels and then jump over the next myelinated area. So it just speeds that transmission. We see issues with demyelination in people that suffer from multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis is a disease of the central nervous system where the body starts to attack its own myelin, myelin on axons in the brain and spinal cord. So that's a very uh, serious condition and it's common, not common, but it's more common here in the Midwest compared to other areas of the country. So we're doing a lot of research to figure out what is causing these cells to start to attack myelin over the axons and how we can slow that process or even reverse it. 